And your point is what? I want to show you the kinds of questions we must face. Right. Bantu education maimed our youth. Yes. It underdeveloped them deliberately, brutally. Why must we pretend that after 1994 they suddenly are capable of all kinds of miraculous development? It's, not, it's nonsense. We need to have, we need to have mediated stages of strategic stages which will make it possible for those students or wherever they are to uh, compete on a, on a fairly level, fairly level playing field. In addition to that, and I, I really need to stress this point, not everybody has to be a doctor. You know, it, it, it's just silly to think that everybody must be a doctor. If we could uh, educate and train a few thousand per year, a few thousand barefoot doctors with a four-year course or whatever, we would make such a difference to the health of this country. And if the universities that have medical faculties were to pool their resources, we could make a huge difference and still produce the best doctors. Could I just I'm ask just saying you we're not doing no, no, some of this Let me just take that uh, before I move on to the other panelists. Let me just ask you this. If you did that, that four year, because it comes back to the question I asked, and you had this four year program. In essence, what would happen on your analysis today, probably rightly so in terms of what happens, is that the vast majority of those people will be black. So what? Now I'll tell you what, the vast majority of the people of the MBCHB will be white. And what will we then have in our country? We'll say, oh, they're the second rate ones. Uh, they're the second, I don't want a second rate doctor. I want a real doctor. And we re-entrench, in a sense, a racial thing, which is what I think Professor, uh, Dr. Price is saying. Dennis, I don't want to get in an argument with you. I think that's nonsense. Why is that nonsense? I'll that's the thrust of his argument. Why is that nonsense? I, you don't have to see these things in terms of color, for heaven's sake. These are South Africans we're talking about. And I'm, I'm saying again that in one and a half to two generations, yes. the entire situation will have changed. Why do you want to okay. see overnight you know, you, if you believe in miracles, you really have to have your head red. I agree. All right. Let me... No, 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 no hang on a minute. I know you're the boss here, but not on this panel. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> so I do want to ask the SRC president. I was intrigued, just following from what's going on. If we were courageous, <laughs> is what Dr. Alexander, Professor Alexander is saying, yeah. we would accept, following from what the Archbishop has said, an outrageous system of education which, quite frankly, has carried on for 16 more years, i.e. from 94 to now. The Archbishop is saying, I'll ask him himself later to explicate on it, that in effect, if we really wanted energy, we'd be marched down Parliament and be actually telling them, what on earth are you doing with our children at the moment? Because that's where the real problem lies, yeah. rather than dealing with here. This, is, this problem is a direct product of their incompetence. Sure. Right? So the question I want to ask you is, you say, well, you know, let's deal with race now. What is that to do? Is that as a palliative for a few years, which is what Professor Alexander is talking about? Because actually, are we then pretending that actually all is well in our universities when it isn't? And secondly, flying from that, as you say, well, at some particular point in time, we have to have the courage to say that race will stop. When should it stop? Should it stop when you qualified at St. John's for you? And, I mean, because what's the difference between you and the white student who went to St. John's? Yeah. Where does it stop in your view? Thanks. Um, so the two questions. Yeah. The one is, why not all march to Parliament and try and change the education? No, that's not my point. My point is, uh, uh, not why not march to Parliament. I'm happy, well, I, judges can't march to Parliament. I mean, the rest of the <laughs> I'd love to march. Um, but the point, the point about it is, my question is a different one. My question is, if you were really candid, you'd have to say that this debate about affirmative action, which is what Professor Alexander says, is a dishonest debate because it really is trying to pretend that we can solve problems which have to be dealt with entirely differently. And why can't we just be honest and accept the fact that given apartheid at universities, which are ultimately elitist institutions, yeah. we are going to have a skewed distribution for a while yet. And the real point to prevent that is to get our education system right so that children's futures are not stuffed up by an unbelievably outrageous primary and secondary sure. education. Sure, two assumptions. The first, yeah. the first there is that the two are mutually exclusive processes. So I would agree, we should actually be candid enough to do that. But we also need to require from every single institution in South Africa, not just parliament, but also our universities, 
that they take the developmental goals that this country needs to, to take very seriously into account. And so I believe it should happen in two ways. Yeah. Number one, we should be marching to parliament and we should be saying the education system needs to be better, but the education system feeds the university system and if the university system isn't accepting or isn't tied into the education system in the way we need it to be, then when these students come to university, they're gonna perpetuate the kinds of ideologies that are perpetuated, the schisms are gonna just affect, but only a little bit later. So we should do both, and they're not mutually exclusive processes. But and they are if the fact is that you are fooling yourself by believing but there that you, you can produce into... people at universities at the moment mm. who shouldn't be here, and that we should actually, sure. instead of fooling ourselves, we should deal, which is what I think Professor Alexander is saying. Oh, you're not saying that, sorry, I thought you were saying that. Why were you not saying that? It's not just a misrepresentation, it's a very dangerous one. All right, well tell me why. One of the things I haven't had a chance to say. Well, say it. Is, is that fundamentally, if you think of a new South Africa, you've got to change the paradigm of excellence. Okay. Well, I want the to paradigm of excellence within which we are forced, all of us, mm. blue, green, or white, all of us are forced to compete within this paradigm of excellence. It's a Eurocentric one, and it's one which necessarily... Okay, I, I know that. At that point, I wanted to come to, if I may. Okay. Okay. But what I, what I was putting... But so I'm not, so no, I'm no, not I saying... On misrepresentation because what you said is, what's so terrible if, for example, in the short term, all the doctors are white? And that's what I was putting No, no, that's to. simplifying... A, it's well, it's your point, not mine. I was, no, no, I'm no, just no, quoting no, you. You're oversimplifying the okay. issue. But the, it, point, the point that I'm making is, which is to, to put to him, to, 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 to uh, SRT president, is simply this is to what extent, if we act, are we honest with ourselves, that we've got a much more foundational problem, which in a sense affirmative action seeks to pass that over, rather than deal with foundation. That's the point I'm really trying to put to yep, but Sorry, but let him answer now, please. Don't turn it into... No, 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 no thank you, it's his chance now. Carry on. Thank you. Hello. Just testing. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. As I said, I think the, the response is, exa is exactly the same. We need all hands on deck for this problem. Um, Universe, the university system shouldn't be relying on the education system to solve all of its problems and vice versa. Every single institution needs to be doing what it can. So yes, we should be marching to parliament. Yes, we should be demanding more from the education system. But in the meantime, we need to work with what we have and we need to create a society which is as equal as possible. And universities have a role to play in that. Um, and if you want me to touch on the elitist question, I can later. Yes, I'd like you to touch on the Thanks elitist question. Much. Yes. Thank you. This, this idea that universities are necessarily elitist institutions is true, but not if they're artificially racial elitist institutions. Um, and that's happened over the past. So we had elitist institutions, yes, any university in the world is elitist, but in South Africa it was magnified because they were also racially elite. So we're not trying to move the elitism, we're trying to remove the racial elitism. And those are oh, but it'll still be elites. elite. It'll still be elite. They'd still be elite, but what we're looking for is a random distribution of talent across the different quintiles. And that may take time. That may take time. But if we don't act now, then we may get it later than it necessarily could have happened. And why should we wait? All right. D uh, David, uh, I'll come back to Max. But th this particular point of legitimacy and the particular point that you've got to actually accept that you can't just freeze the frame under the apartheid basis and allow that to be reproduced, which is, I suspect, what's being argued on this side, which is, to, 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 to a large degree, you can't just wait for the education system of this go uh, the government's education system to improve. And that therefore one has to have some proxy for what is massive disadvantage in the society. So race is imperfect, but it's better than nothing. We can't have nothing. Right, well, nobody is suggesting uh, that we do nothing. So what uh, would you do then well, if I, you were the principal? I wouldn't be the principal. It's not a job that I want. No. <laughs> I could respond in a number of ways, but I won't. So what I will simply say is, but if you were, what would you do? Hypothetically, you're a philosopher, you can work in hypothetical. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, I can, and I'm quite a practical philosopher as well. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, just, hands on philosopher. But I'm just telling you, I'm just asking, what yeah. would you do? Because well, you, you, we got a I problem, mean, and how do we deal with right, it? Right, so I think in, in the past the debate has been do nothing or have race based preferences. And now, as I see, one of the shifts in the debate is it's not that. It's we've got to do something. We, we, we all recognize we've got to do something. Uh, but uh, is it that we're going to rectify this by race-based preferences or are we going to rectify it in some other way? Now, I think it's perfectly legitimate to be rectifying injustices by means of giving preference to people who are disadvantaged. Now, the, the counter-argument here is that that's not practical. 
Now, a few things to say in response to that. The first is, if, if that were the only motivation, if that, if that were really the motivation for, uh, uh, for race-based preferences in admissions, then I would ask why is the university also committed to race-based preferences in appointments? Because in appointments, you're actually making decisions on an individual by individual basis, and you're interrogating people's past. And even in those cases, the disadvantage may be less important because you want to put in the classroom, for example, the person who is best able, not uh, most or least disadvantaged. So I think we need to look at those two issues uh, in tandem because I think they reveal something about the motivations of people in the admissions case. In other words, if you really say it's an impractical thing at the admissions, then well then concede the appointments point. Concede that in the appointments front, we can actually do this on an individual by individual basis. So that's the, the, the one thing about the seamlessness, I think, between, between those two cases. The second point is a point I made in a number of contexts, and that is that it's often said, well, there's nothing that we can do. But there are examples where people have said there's nothing they can do, and when their backs are against the wall, they find something they can do. And the case I like to cite here is the South African blood transfusion services, which claimed that they had to use race as a proxy for HIV-infected blood, and they were using that until there was a public outcry about that, and suddenly they found an alternative way of screening blood without using race as a proxy. They insisted for years that they could only use race. And when their back's against the wall, then they could find a way. It costs a little more, but it doesn't have all these sort of degrading uh, overtones. And I think that if UCT's backs were against the wall, if there were a court case, for example, that ruled that what was going on here was inappropriate, UCT would find a way. Because necessity is the mother of invention. And some alternative would be found. The next point is that... Uh, there are imperfections in working out who is disadvantaged. That is a difficult task, mm -hmm. and there are imperfections there. But we're already aware of the imperfections in using race as a, uh, as, as a proxy. We know that there are all kinds of people who are going to be entirely privileged, who are going to get advantaged on the basis of also being black. Because, because no that's system good. is perfect. That's no system right. is perfect, and that's right. So what you've got to then be doing is making choices about which kinds of imperfections you're going to go for, and you're going to make choices about how to minimize the imperfections in whatever system you go for. And so it may well be true that there'll be some students, let's say, from bishops, who will be disadvantaged as a result of going for the disadvantage criterion rather than the race criterion, but there'll also be some people who are not at bishops who are already at a disadvantaged school who will thereby be advantaged because they'll get the extra favoring on the basis of being disadvantaged. So every mechanism of distributing places in a university is going to cost somebody something. And Correct. So the question, and so the question, the question is, sorry, so the question is this. In a society like ours, where it's common cause that race and class truly are overlaid, one with the other, right. that therefore the, the least damaging is to accept <clears throat> that given the fact that we'd all accept that as a result of class, people really suffer <clears throat> huge, <clears throat> egregious disadvantage economically, socially, politically, in every other way. And that therefore, because race overlays that, that, that to a large degree that's the least disadvantage and, the, and probably the best system in an imperfect world of actually ensuring that people who are disadvantaged get a decent access to this institution and others like it. You can say that, but whether it's true or not is another matter. What and do that's you mean? What's true? What, what do you disagree well, with? Well, the race is overlaid with the class? No, you, that, that part... Don't you accept? No, that part we can accept, so but, but there's a further, following, yes, what's the further point you made was therefore it's the best proxy. Well, what's the other... Well, I haven't heard one that's better. Well, that's there are lots of other proxies you can use. So the one is to use use uh, school, what school you went to. Okay. We've heard of complexities there, but there are ways of refining that system. So one thing you can do is not just purely at what school you matriculated from, but how many years you spent in a privileged school. Okay, so if you have people who've been 12 years in a privileged school, okay. then you say, okay, now you don't count as disadvantage. If you've been there for the last three years of your high school thing, then you do. Right. So you refine the mechanisms and their ways of doing okay. it. Okay, I want to, uh, I, I know you want to, Max, you were desperate to answer a whole range of things, so if you want to, can you? Going to let I'm you going to give the Archbishop a chance, but I, you I'll putting your hand up, and then I want to ask you, carry on. 